hi guys everyone um thanks for coming out today um we are students of dentistry in pitball dental so we are having this event today to focus on the dat prep um this is our amazing team who helped put this um, event together um i just want to thank you all for coming out today and to get this started we have two amazing panelists um we encourage everyone to either ask their own questions using the raise their hand um feature or just type it in the chat and we can read your question off but we really encourage you to ask any questions that you guys have because we really want this to be very audience participation based. Um, so we can start us off with Stephen and Jack. And if either uh, one of you want to start off um, and just introduce yourself, what school you go to and what um, test strategy you use to prepare for the DAT. Go for it, Stephen. Oh, look at that. Okay, I'll start. Um, my name is Steven. Uh, I am a first year dental student at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee, and um, almost going to be transitioning into my second year very soon. Uh, but I, I have a YouTube channel. That's how I sort of connected with all of these wonderful people here. And I make YouTube videos about my experiences in dental school and, and some of the things I've learned and uh, some of the things I've been through. And as far as the DAT, I uh, went through in 2019, which seems like a very, very distant memory at this point. And I took my DAT in 2019 and all of the preparation that I did was, was DAT bootcamp. Um, DAT bootcamp was relatively new back then. It had been created years before, but it was still relatively new. And now it seems to be dominating the space for good reason. There are many, many benefits to DAT bootcamp. And uh, it's really interesting because I went through a few years ago and used bootcamp and it saved my life on the DAT. And now I've had the opportunity to work for bootcamp, the company to create a school, a uh, school, a class uh, for dental students specifically. So when you all get to dental school in a, a year or two, you'll be able to use this course that I'm developing and, and bootcamp as a whole is growing greatly every day, adding new, uh, new courses, new teachers, and expanding just from the DAT out into your entire entire uh, dental education. So that's sort of a, a brief introduction of, of me and, and how I got here. How am I supposed to follow that, huh? Jeez. So I am a dental student right now at University of California, San Francisco, also a D1, the same as Steven. Steven and I actually know each other pretty well. Um, we've done a YouTube video before. I've been on his podcast. He has a podcast as well. And so we met throughout this whole space and it's a great way to connect. I mean, I met everyone here as well. A lot of people here from um, social media. Um, in terms of the DAT, I would say, I mean, I use DAT Bootcamp as well. Um, and DAT Bootcamp was pretty much the only one only program in the scene and it was uh, extraordinary program. Uh, it helped, you know, it's 97 people, 97% of people use DAT bootcamp to study. Um, I've worked for DAT bootcamp um, as well, as well as DAT booster, which is a completely new program. I recommend them both heavily. I did, really didn't know about DAT booster uh, until uh, they really like reached out and I got to experience the program and they got a lot of good stuff on there as well. So I think both of them are great resources. If you can, definitely get both. Um, and then don't ask me if you're only choosing one because I really don't know the answer to that. Okay, awesome. So thanks for letting us know what you guys used. Um, I, I took my DAT yesterday, but um, the one thing that I was kind of wondering is, um, for everyone else who's uh, um, taking it soon, what do you guys do like with the week prior to your exam? So you like stay calm. How did, how did you stay calm during that? And what did you guys do the week beforehand? So the, the week leading up to the DAT, and I think the entire time period leading up to it, there's a lot of emotions. Uh, it's one of the, probably for me, it was one of the scariest times in my life. There's so much uncertainty. Uh, for me, I was going through boot camps, practice tests, and I was not doing so great on them. So I sort of had this, uh, I had a goal, of course, going into the, into the DAT that I wanted to get a certain score. I wanted to get, you know, 21, 22, somewhere in there, but my practice tests were significantly lower than that. So I had all of these, just all of these emotions, all of these fears, thoughts running through my head. And <clears throat> one of the nice things about boot camp was they, they gave me a really 
solid schedule, a distributed schedule for you that you can follow. So I was really diligent about that. And I was able to use that final week the way that they intended for it. And so that we're still, you know, practice tests and things that I was going through. And then just making sure that every time I went through my practice tests, I was going through the answers that I got wrong. I understood why I got them wrong. And I was making note of that as far as the, you know, the week leading up to it. And then basically the day before the week leading up to it was essentially business as, as it had been for the past two and a half months of my studying. Uh, but the day before I, I recognized was a time where I needed to give myself a little bit of a break. And it felt weird because I was like, well, I only have a few more hours until I take this massive exam. Uh, but I did, I did a little bit of study in the morning and then I sort of took the day for myself to kind of just uh, relax, take a deep breath and, and kind of decompress as much as I possibly could. And then uh, that, that ended up being, you know, I think one of my biggest pieces of advice for the DAT is that you need to trust your studying and trust the time that you've spent uh, leading up to this point. And so to think that in those last few, six, eight hours, you're going to drastically change your score with something that you're, you're going to read or, or learn, uh, perhaps, but I think ultimately you need to trust the, the months of time or however long you've put into it and, and use that, that last little bit of time to be with your family, to do something that helps you calm down and take, take your mind off it a little bit. And I think that's probably the best way I could say to prepare in those last hours before the exam. Yeah, really good point. So I think that DAT bootcamp has like rides the line between like the balance between um, making you, hold on, let me start over. So DAT rides the line between um, scaring you a little bit because the test scores that you'd get when you're taking the DAT bootcamp is like a little bit lower than what people typically get on the test. Um, so scaring you, but then also making you confident because you're, if you're following the study guide, you're consistently going over the material and you are going to be retaining a lot of information. Um, my approach, I was following Ari's guide as well. I think that's the best way to do it. It's just so easily laid out for you that you can just follow it and not think about what to study during, um, during the days that you're studying for the DAT and just focus all your energy on learning everything that you need to learn for the DAT, which is a lot. Uh, I remember tapering down a little bit. So it was kind of like I did track and if anyone did sports, like sometimes leading up to a big event, you want to you know, decrease your mileage or, or like decrease your, um, like the amount of hours you spent. So the last two or three days, I remember studying less. So I was studying like six hours every day. And then the last couple of days I was studying like four and then to uh, just completely relaxing my mind. I remember the day before, oh, I remember, okay. The day before I remember like getting a massage, like sitting in the hot tub, not too long so you don't get dehydrated. So like you're really treating your body like an athlete. You want your mental state to be completely there, 100% there, like you're going into a boxing match or something. Um, so that is what I did. And I think that to do that successfully, you need to structure your, your life in a way where you have a routine and you know that, oh, during this time, this time, I'm gonna be studying for the DAT. So your body will be really used to it. And then by the time that you do take it, your mind will be sharp and then you can be focused for the whole duration because it's a long test. Thank you for that answer. Um, so another question that was asked in the group chat, I believe Munsef was like, I think his question is, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe he's asking if using one resource, just like, you know, the DAT bootcamp, is that um, sufficient? Would you recommend using more than one resource? Is that kind of overkill, you know? Um, yeah, do you guys have any experience like, juggling more than one resource for DAT prep? So my, th my theory on this is that everybody's different. Everybody in this Zoom meeting is different. We're all different. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. So I think for some people, you'll be fine to just go through and stick with one resource. But what I would advise is, and once again, I'm going to keep talking about bootcamp because it's what I know and it's what I used. But bootcamp 
when I was going through boot camp, it gave me everything that I needed. But if there were certain things that I didn't know as well, or I just wasn't able to learn, that's when I would have gone out and looked for another resource. For me, I was really bad at math. I'm just extremely horrible at math, just in life, like in general. And so if I, and actually in, in retrospect, I probably would have gone back if I had a little bit more time and I'd known how bad I actually was at math, I probably would have gone back and gotten a specific resource to help me with that section alone. And so I think that what you should do with this is go through whatever major program you're using and start to understand what you're learning and what you're not learning. And when you go through your practice exams, figure out what you're performing well on and, and maybe what you're not doing so well on. And if you need to add an extra resource, like an organic resource to help you with that section, then do it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that, or I wouldn't go into it thinking that I'm only using one resource and therefore I'm not going to succeed because that's certainly not the case. I more or less agree with, with Steven there. So I think DAT bootcamp, what I took was completely sufficient to, uh, to study for the DAT. They also, if you look, follow the, the guide, they also, you know, want you to buy DAT with destroyer, math destroyer, all of that. Um, I think that personally it was overkill, but I also didn't get like a 30 on the DAT. So I know that some people do say that it's worth it. Um, but I think because DAT bootcamp has such a vast selection of resources and so many different tests that I was having trouble going through all of it anyways. So there was no need for me to go and do the DAT Destroyer book or seek out another resource. I mean, at the time there wasn't any other resource. Uh, I think more or less the same, you're gonna get the same experience with uh, DAT Booster uh, because for one of the projects I did with them, I had to do a lot of research and it seems like the consensus is that the, that the practice tests are really similar to the actual DAT. So, if money wasn't a factor, um, get both because you want, you know, the new practice test questions, right? And then you can try and get like the best of both worlds and different programs might have different strengths. I don't know if DAT Bootcamp has updated, they probably have um, updated their program since when I took it in 2018. Uh, but I know like DAT Booster has uh, like some 3D, functionality when you're looking at pattern folding or you know just different explanations that you're going to get for questions as well so the more knowledge the better the more you study the better of course quality and quantity um, but you definitely can do well on the DAT if you just choose one of them all right um thank you for those answers we do have another question in the chat uh, Swati is asking, how many months did it take to prepare for the DAT? I'm planning on taking it by the end of the summer or September. You want to take this one first, Jack? For sure. Um, so I remember studying for the DAT. It was actually during the summer as well. So I took it between my sophomore year and junior year summer. I decided to take it early just finished all the main sciences. That was the bulk of the DAT anyways. So I took the entire summer and I think it's definitely enough time because um, I don't know if you have like a part-time job, um, you definitely able to juggle that. If you have a full-time job, a little bit harder, but I'd say how I structured it was I would have a three hour session in the morning. So I'd wake up, work out, eat, three hour session until like one or 2 p.m. Take a lunch break and then do another three hour session. And that would just be it for the day. Um, if you can do that consistently and be focused, I, I think that's definitely enough time. When I was researching how long to study for the DAT, I believe the consensus was around 300 hours, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I definitely, took longer to study for the DAT than 300 hours. But if you have a whole summer, you'll be able to, um, and you put like most of your effort into DAT, you should be fine. Um, thank you. I also, um, I am working a part-time job during the summer. Like I work as a dental assistant too. So that's why I didn't know if it would like 
interfere because I do work like seven, eight hours whenever I do work. So I don't know. So seven to eight hours a day? Uh, yeah, but I'm trying to not work like as frequently, like maybe one or two days a week instead of like four days a week. Like I did last summer because it's the same place I worked last summer too. Yeah. I mean, you always have to be working on all parts of your application, right? Yeah. So I think what you're doing is great. If you can get it down to one or two days a week, though, those days can be like your break days as well, okay. which you'll need to put in anyways, at least one day a week of just break. So um, it's, just, it's definitely do. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think once again, I'll, I'll say this again for this question. I think everybody's different and it depends on your obligations and how each day looks for me. Uh, I think I studied in total. It was probably about two and a half to three months, but the first, the, so my, my originally plan to take it like late May. And then what happened was I started studying while I was in school. So I was in a regular semester of undergrad and I started my studying and I was doing pretty well with that until finals week came around for school and I didn't touch any DAT material for an entire week. And it threw me off my schedule and I got really nervous and upset. And so what I ended up doing was rescheduling to June 11th. So I just pushed it back a little bit, which I was nervous about because that changed when I was going to actually apply, which kind of a different situation, but it ended up being really good because I had that extra time. So I think the a really important thing here is go ahead and as soon as possible, do sort of whatever calculations you need to do and get a date scheduled because having that date on a calendar that you can see and you can sort of count down to is really, really important. And it'll also help you to understand how much you need to put, like put in every day or every week. Um, and also too, I, I, I'm assuming it's still probably the same way. It can be difficult to schedule a time for the DAT because the time slots fill up pretty quickly, at least they used to when I, when I went through. So having it on the calendar and set is a really like solid thing. It's also mentally, it's nice to just know that's when it is. I have this many days left or, or however else you want to do it. Great. Thank you. So our next question is regarding like the actual exam. Um, what are some specific strategies you guys have uh, when taking it regarding timing specifically? The, the timing thing is, was interesting for me because that was a really important thing that I needed to deal with. Um, and so I had this plan for the, the science section is the first section you take. And I, the way I had been taking it was, if I remember correctly, I would skip, I, you guys are going to have to remind me, what's the order of the science section? It was bio, gen, chem, and then ochem. Okay. So I, I would go I basically left Gen Kim for last because I didn't like Gen Kim. So I would go through the, those, the bio and the organic, and then I would get to the Gen Kim because my theory with that was let's get through the questions I'm likely to get right and then go to the ones that I'm going to have a little bit more trouble with. As it turned out, the actual format of the DAT like on the computer was a little bit different than, than boot camp. It was essentially the same thing, but it was slightly different. So I remember getting on the DAT and skipping around to questions was a little different. And I freaked out for a second because I was like, I don't know how to skip to the next section and skip through, you know, Gen Kim or whatever, uh, that ended up being fine. I ended up being totally okay there. The one thing that sucked for me was that the math section, once again, I said I had trouble with the math section. I had a, um, I don't know if I should say this. I don't want to make you guys nervous. This was just my experience. I, they give you like a, a laminated piece of paper and they give you a couple expo, you know, dry erase markers for the math section. Well, for the whole thing, but for, that, for the math section. And I had been practicing all the way through with a pencil and paper. So all of my math, when I was practicing on my practice test was like tiny. I could, you know, I could just fill up an entire page with a bunch of little calculations. We got on the actual exam. I had this thick expo marker and I, I, I didn't actually write this calculation, but two times two equals four was like huge. Cause I couldn't get the marker was massive. And so it completely threw me off on my timing. And I ended up kind of not doing great on that section, which is okay. Cause math isn't necessarily the most important section of the DAT, but um, I guess the, the point of that story is if there's something that's on the test that's bothering you, like there's something like that, like the marker's really thick and you need like a newer one that has a finer point, don't be afraid to ask the people that are overseeing your exam because it's really important that you have the ideal um, conditions for your exam. And so just a, a little side story, don't get freaked out by that. That was just my experience. And obviously it didn't derail me from, from going to dental school, but 
uh, timing is really important. And, and when you when you are studying, it's absolutely something you should be doing is, is simulating the actual exam and trying to work on some of these strategies to help you with your timing. Yeah, I agree with Steven. I mean, you do want to simulate the exam. So uh, I didn't do this, but I'll just get a whiteboard and marker and then practice on that and just write all your questions on that when you're um, getting closer to the exam, because I think that will help calm your, calm your nerves since everything will be just feel so familiar. I think when I'm taking the DAT, I really want to focus on my strengths. And that would be like my general advice is just focus on your strengths. So if you get to a question that you have to really think about, go ahead and skip it. That question is still going to be like working itself out in your mind a little bit. Like you'll have a better time when you go back to the question, answer all the questions that you do know. Then you go back uh, and go ahead and try and figure out the tough ones if you have time. Uh, what's great about the DAT is that you're not penalized for um, wrong answers. So, you know, at the end, even if you're really struggling, just click, 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 next, 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 next. Um, and then one more point. Right. So I think that visualization is really important. Uh, whenever I, before I go into any type of interviews or big tests, I'll use visualization techniques as well as like power posing. And I know that there's like studies that are pretty contrary for like power posing and it doesn't really work, but it makes me feel good. So I think that going into the test with confidence and especially visualizing, visualizing the night before, as well as just throughout the progress for um, just thinking about what could happen during the test day, everything that could go wrong, everything that could go right. Like if you're having a really tough time on this set of problems. If you visualize before, like what you want to do, like if you want to um, just tell yourself that you need to go like quicker or just like skip more questions, um, just go ahead and do that. Just have a game plan in your head. So when something does go wrong in the DAT, you'll be able to know what to do. All right, thank you for that. So our next question in the chat is, what were your guys' majors? I'm pressured to switch to a bio major despite not being interested in the subject, but from observation, I've noticed that bio majors do the best. So what are your guys' opinions on this? I did quite a bit of research on this. I remember when I was choosing my major. And, um, you know, I gotta say, if you're not interested in biology, I think you shouldn't go into dentistry at all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, literally, you can choose any single major that you want. And there's actually, I looked at so many statistics for this. And for biology majors, the percentage of biology majors I apply to get into dental school or medical school that actually do get in, like the percentage, the proportion is lower than other majors. And this is why. So Everyone is going in as a biology major, chemistry major, whatever, right? So it's really mundane. It really doesn't make you stand out. You need to be on top of your game for all the other sections, you know, extracurriculars, volunteering, shadowing, all of that in order to stand out on your application because that's who you're going to be, you know, comparing yourself to when, when they're like looking at the application. The benefit to that is that you're learning a lot of the core science courses and stuff that they're going to be testing on the DAT. So the DAT is going to come easier. So your DAT score will be higher, but you need to find out ways to stand out. If you can go the other route, which, oh man, like I didn't do this. I was a biochemistry major, um, but I would recommend if you really are set or even if you're leaning moderately to heavy towards a major that isn't science related just to go for it because when the mission counselor gets your application and sees that you're a different major let's say like your art major history major writing major any of those or any other ones um, they're going to be a little intrigued by your application if you can have that major you're not taking a lot of the core science classes that would make you do well on the DAT right 
So if you do as well in the DAT as someone with a science major, but you studied something different, they'll be impressed by that. Um, so the percentage of people that are like non-science majors that apply, actually a higher proportion of them get in. Yeah, I was from three years ago. Topic and um, actually my major scored the lowest of matriculants, I believe. I'm health and exercise science. And um, when I did check those tasks that you were talking about, I believe English was the first one, which was kind of interesting but um mine is the lowest and i'm like it's not far enough to make me unique but it's also not super close i just don't like ecology stuff that kind of drives me insane i do not care about plants or frogs do not want to hear about it but i feel like it would really help me in the test um i'm really into human bio and whatnot so i'm like i'm not far enough to the point where i'm very unique um a lot of pre-dents at my school have my major but it's also not close enough for me to be in an optimal state to do good on the bio section, which is my opinion would be my um, hardest section or weakest point. So if I could just kind of add my thoughts here, first off, I was an English major. So I am, I, I fully embody what you're kind of approaching here. I didn't want to major in biology because I essentially, I've always liked English. I've always liked writing. And I wanted to have a little bit of variety in my days. So I didn't want to just be in science classes all day because I knew that when I got to dental school, it'd be science all day, which it 100% is. So I, I went ahead and, and went with English. And to be honest with you, it was something that I really was able to, to focus on and capitalize on when it came to applying. My entire personal statement was geared towards communication and what I'd learned in my English courses and how I planned to bring those to dentistry specifically. So I think that you may not think that your major is that different from biology, but it certainly is. And it certainly will allow you to stand out as long as you um, capitalize on that and make it clear why you're going to use your major in your future. As far as the DAT is concerned, I'm, I'm fully on the boat that if you, if you go through all of your prereqs for dental school and you use a, something like DAT bootcamp, which has a very, very significant biology section for you to learn from, you'll be able to do fine in the DAT. I don't think that you necessarily need to take additional biology courses, for example, to do well on DAT biology because DAT biology essentially covers the courses that are required for dental school admission. So your basic biologies and like you said, some of that ecology stuff. As far as you're, you know, you're, not, you're not loving biology, I get it. I'm not a I don't love science. Like it's just, it's not something that's always come naturally like to me. Like I said, I was an English major for a reason. I've never loved science with, with everything. I've always been extremely interested in parts of it, but there are just unfortunately going to be things in your curriculum in undergrad and also in dental school that you don't love. That you just kind of have to power through because at the end of the day, what you're going to be learning is what you love, but to get there, you have to go through the stepping stones of ecology and some things that maybe you don't find as interesting. And so power through them and trust that if you're, if you do, obviously you're taking your prereqs, um, taking those and you're doing your best in those and you're, you're approaching the DAT and, and putting a lot of time into those sections and really learning that material. Mm -hmm. I don't think that not majoring in biology is, is going to be any sort of detriment to you at all. Yeah. And my measure does follow a narrative. It's not just out of the blue. I am a fitness instructor. I've been doing it for years. There you go. Um, so maybe, so you're like, that's the thing I always try to tell people is a lot of people think that they're not unique when it comes to applying for dental school. And I had those same feelings, but if you really sit down and think about your life and all of your experiences and how they've taken you to the point where you're at right now, and then also your education and what you, the, the decisions you've made to get there, you will find unique aspects of your life. And it's really important to talk about those on your personal statement, which we're not really talking about in this, in this, but there is a unique story that you have. Everybody has one. And so that's, I, I wouldn't worry about, about that, honestly. Thank you so much. Yeah. I love your guys' videos. I just started listening to your podcast on, uh, on the Apple yeah. app. And yeah. yeah, I love your videos. Super high definition, by the way. Um, yeah, just keep it up. Uh, you guys are like celebrities to us and <laughs> we look up to you. And so keep up the good work. Um, it's really helpful to watch because I don't know a lot of pre-dents and you guys are like veterans of the whole process. So 
keep it up. Well, listen, man, thank you. Um, and honestly, like, it's crazy to say, cause I've heard it from people that were older than me in my entire life, but I was in your shoes not very long ago. And I know exactly how it feels to be in your position. And so I don't know if, if I actually do help a lot of people, but I hope that just giving you a, a little bit of a glimpse into your future is, is gives you a little bit of assurance and helps you with that extra piece of motivation. So thank you. That means a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know when you're applying to dental school, but we're going to be holding a lot of events over the summer within like a few months. So please like feel free to come to any of them and like ask all your questions because we will be providing um, a platform for that. So yeah. I'm applying in two years, so I'm not too stressed, but I will be at every single one. I just, I need to meet people. I need to network. Um, I would love to have my camera on, but I'm currently studying and my cat is on my face. So that's totally yeah yeah no thank you for being here and thank you for asking your question we love it um on to the next question it's a pretty general question but since we're on this topic of like dental admissions um someone asked in the chat why did you choose dental school um have you thought about choosing something other than dental school I think this is kind of a, an important question because I feel like when you're taking the DAT or something so intense you probably have doubts about like pursuing something that requires so much work but yeah So when I did my um, whole health journey, I started with medicine and I, I definitely dived into different professions because I knew as if like from a kid that I really wanted to go into healthcare, but I just had no idea exactly what part of healthcare. So I remember volunteering in the ER, like senior year of high school, realized that's not enough for me, like no, not, not enough, but it was a little too much for me uh, in terms of you know, how you aren't able to treat everyone, right? Like, let's say if someone has stage four cancer um, or metastatic cancer, there's just like not much you can do. Uh, and then just dealing with the intense, depressing situations of being, you know, having to tell the family or having to tell the kid that their, their close ones are going to die. Not really my vibe. Uh, <laughs> then I looked into optometry as well, as well as physical therapy and another one or two and I just remember like if just doing a bunch of research if you know exactly what the job entails and if you can go and shadow that's the best thing you can do because that will give you the best sense of what it's actually like to do that as your work for the rest of your life right um, another thing that led me towards dentistry is that there's just so many different options when you go to dental school there's opportunities from every area you can go back into education uh, or you can just you can go into one of the specialties you can be a researcher or a anesthesiologist um, oral surgery so I knew that even if I did go go the dentistry route um, and I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do there would be something that fit what I like Um, yeah, so dentistry is a, just a wonderful profession. I actually, my dad's a dentist. I grew up with a, with a father as a dentist. And so that obviously played a big role in my decision to become a dentist as well. But for me, even though I grew up with a, with a father as a dentist, and I always had that kind of idea that I would do it. The first time I actually saw dentistry, uh, from, I always say from the perspective of the practitioner, AKA the first time I assisted somebody. I literally fell in love with it because I had just never seen such an impact on an individual. And all I was doing was assisting somebody who was just yanking teeth, just pull, just extracting teeth. But it was, these people were in pain and the practitioner was taking them out of pain. So I, I couldn't be a bigger fan of dentistry. I don't think it's for everybody. I think it's a, a very difficult profession to get into takes a lot of money, a lot of time. Uh, you know, all of you are, who are pursuing it, you're going to see all of your friends in other fields get out of college and have their job, start to buy the car, start to buy the house, start to get married, all of these things. And you're going to be stuck in school for a lot, a lot longer. But I think at the end of the day, we have an incredibly unique profession that allows us to impact people every single day. You can build relationships with your patients. You can build a team around you full of people who... Um, who help you, but who also have these common goals. 
and you're also in the healthcare field, which is, it's, it is an honor. The ability to call yourself a doctor is, is an honor. And like I said, it takes a lot of hard work, but it's, it's, it's an honor and it's a gift. And so I think for me, I, I really always looked at it once I fell in love with dentistry and I knew it was for me, I didn't even really think about a plan B because I knew that no matter what it took, I was going to get there. And I think that's a good way to do it. Um, cause while having a plan B sounds practical at times, uh, having a plan A and fully being committed to that plan A, I think allows you to do the extra work that it's going to take to get you there. So I could talk about dentistry all day, but I know we have a bunch of questions. I want to get to those. There's one thing I'd like to add to just to ease everyone's mind that maybe don't are in completely falling in love with dentistry. That is okay too. You don't have to love dentistry right now or know that you absolutely love it. If you do, that's amazing. Um, I just like dentistry going into it. I did not fall head over heels um, in love with dentistry before coming to dental school. But I really believe that uh, if you like something, then go ahead and pursue it. And then usually the more investment that you put in it, the more it will develop into your passion because you'll get good at it. You'll get knowledgeable, you know, that will be your thing. So I think it's the same with finding a career. So um, if you like dentistry, if it interests you and you're putting in the work and you decided, hey, this is what I want to do, then that's also just as fine as if you're just in love with dentistry and that's the only thing you can do. All right, thanks guys. So we're going to switch gears a little bit back to the DAT prep. So there's some questions in the chat with um, how would you start studying for boot, with boot camp if it's your first time using it? Like which sections would you tackle first when using it? So just um, go ahead and just, if you'd like, you could use the schedule that Jack and I were talking about earlier. Uh, just get into it. Start, start day one and just try to hit all the subjects, a little bit of each, um, and just start to figure out what is absolutely uh, completely new information to you and what feels a little bit more familiar. And in that first week, you'll be able to figure out, okay, biology is coming pretty naturally to me. I remember all of these topics, but OCHEM is like, uh, it's not going well, whatever. So just start in the beginning with all of it, and then you'll be able to sort of tailor into the specifics. I will say, I think that you should put in time to uh, the perceptual ability test every day, whether it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just put in a little bit of time um, because PAT is not knowledge. It's 100% repetition and practice. I have, I, I have a theory that some people might be a little bit more naturally inclined to be able to visually maneuver things in their mind. But I think that ultimately everybody with enough practice would be able to do really well at the PAT. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts. Yeah, this is a pretty, pretty simple question. I mean, I would say just follow Ari's study guide because he lays it out so well for you. Um, and then when you are studying and you're reviewing questions and you're reviewing the practice tests, that's when you're gonna spend more or less time on certain subjects than others because when you when you're like doing a subject that you aren't very great at, you're gonna have more wrong. You're gonna have like less understanding and like good grasp of the subjects. And that's when you spend more time when you're going over the problems to really figure out every single answer choice and why something's wrong or why something is right. Um, but I think if you follow the study guide, it just makes your life easier. Okay, thank you for those answers. Um, Moonsif is asking in the chat, how many times did you guys take the test? And I guess just to add on to that question, how many times should you expect to take the test to get the score you want? So I believe most people take it once, but a lot of people take it two times or even three times. I mean, if you're on the DAT bootcamp study group, you'll find people from every avenue of life and some people that have taken it, you know, three times, a bunch of people that have. So that's like completely fine. Um, but it comes with a caveat because the dental schools will see every single test score that you take. And it's not like another exam, like the CBSC, the CBSC is like the medical school entrance exam, but like dental school students have to take it if you want to go to oral surgery. That one, it's like everyone takes it two or three times and that's the norm. So if you're, when you're taking a DAT, since a lot of people are just taking it once or twice, you really wanna nail it down those couple of times. 
Um, I remember taking it, so I took it one time the summer of 2018 between my sophomore and junior year, and then I got a 19. So a 19 was not, you know, it's like below average for people that get accepted. But the AT takes a lot out of you and it, you know, it's gonna take a whole summer away from your life pretty much, you know? So I remember studying, I completed the rest of my application, right? but the rest of my application was looking good. So I actually tried to study for the DAT the following summer and my mind just wasn't in it like it was the first time. So I studied during that summer and I did sign up for a test, but the weeks leading up to it, I was getting the same score as I was um, on the practice tests that led me to the 19. So I didn't think it was worth it to take it again because if I took it again and got the same score and there was a chance that maybe I got a lower score that would um, decrease my chances of getting into dental school. So that was a combination of me feeling good about the rest of my application and also just being lazy and not wanting to put in the work to go through that process over again when I thought that, you know what, the rest of my application is looking fine. And America is, you know, there's a lot of holistic schools if you're in other countries, cause like I'm Canadian, Canadian schools are not as holistic as American schools. Um, I still thought I had a good shot. So I, I took it once, I was able to kind of get lucky and get the score that I really wanted to get, didn't expect to get. Um, I will say, I don't think anybody here would do this, but don't ever take the DAT just to test out the waters. If you're going to take the DAT, you want to have prepared fully for it. Uh, I don't know if that's a common thing these days because it's really common advice to give. But yeah, don't ever just go into it and be like, ah, oh, we'll just see what I can get and take it. Um, make sure that the first time you take it, you have given it your all. And if you have to take it again, that's absolutely okay. I have multiple people in my class. Like I'm talking, seems like more than more people than not who took it two or three times. I have multiple friends who took it three times. So it's not something that you obviously want because it's a lot of work, but uh, it is, and once again, there, there shouldn't necessarily be an expectation that you're gonna have to take it two or three times to get the score you want. Just give it your all for that first time. If it doesn't go the way you want, there's nothing wrong with taking it again. So that's my, that's my advice there. Thank you. Um, so we have another question in the chat and it's asking, how would you recommend starting to study for um, the PAT periodically before studying for the full DAT? Since Steven said it is more of a practice section rather than a knowledge-based one, any resources? Yeah, so I used, I used bootcamp once again. Uh, I said at the beginning that bootcamp was all I used and it was effective. So once again, I think that everybody's different and if you need to go out and use extra resources to do it, but um, yeah, the PAT is just practice. Like you can literally, I'm pretty sure there's an app on your phone. Bootcamp probably has an app now where you can just get practice questions and you just start doing them. Make sure that you've done the, uh, to start with the PAT, I think you need to do the, the theory side and, and understand how the questions are asked. For example, uh, cube counting didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me until somebody explained it's like pouring a bucket of paint on a bunch of cubes, which sides are covered in paint. So you need to know what they're actually asking before you just start doing practice questions. But once you understand what the questions are asking, it's a standard format. So from the day you start studying to the day you take the DAT, it's going to be the same type of question. So it's literally just repetition. And um, you know, there's sp specific tactics that you can that you can do for each section. Uh, some some are easier than others, but just start practicing and and put a little bit of time in. You know, if you're waiting in the line at Chipotle or if you're about to go to bed, whatever it is, just put in 15 minutes on uh, some of these apps and just go through questions. The more you can see, the better. Because I, like I said, I don't know if that's actually a fact, but I think that the PAT is, is just practice. It's just repetition. Um, it's not like you're not going to be able to understand how to do the PAT. It's just practicing to the point where it's so second nature to you. You've seen so many different questions. You're like, you just see it in your head and it, and it makes sense, so. So does boot camp like cover the, the theories and all the stuff you were talking about? They do, yeah, they do. Yeah, they have uh, the beginning of each section of boot camp is, is a video series. Uh, interestingly, uh, a colleague of mine, Joel Meyerson is the one who created the 
the, um, the sections for the PAT. So he made videos explaining what each question's asking, explaining how he'll give you multiple different ways to answer the question or like, I guess, tactics that you can use. Um, and you, the cool thing about that is you can test them out and see like, oh, this one took me too much time and it didn't really work for me, but this one worked. Um, so go through all of that first, obviously, and then just repetition. Yeah, I completely agree with exposure. So the more you can expose yourself to the questions, um, then the better off that you will be. Uh, Joel's videos are actually really entertaining. Uh, he has a really cute dog that he puts in his videos. I don't know if you, you've gotten there yet, but you'll, you'll love the videos. Um, can someone tell me that took the DAT recently? Did, does DAT bootcamp have like a 3D section or function when on the PAT? They, they did for um, like the top front end that helped me a lot. So you could, like visualize the actual shape, I think helped. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so top front end, uh, again, both softwares like DAT Bootcamp and DAT Booster are gonna be great. Um, I think for the PAT section, if I were to take it again, I would actually use um, DAT Booster just because I know that they were specialized in the PAT section. Like before DAT Booster was DAT Booster, it was just PAT Booster. So that's what they focused on. And I know they have a lot of 3D functionality. Um, I remember going through pattern folding for one of the projects I did with them. And I, I really liked how you could like click on each different step, like the arrow, and then it would fold it. And then you can drag around 360 degrees and just see everything. Um, but both softwares are gonna be great. Uh, and the longer you can study for it, the better, unless it's angle ranking. Angle ranking, you know, like the, the curve that you learn is like, it's pretty steep at first, and then it just levels off. There's, uh, you can study angle ranking for, every single day for the rest of your life and you you still apparently you know won't be able to to do you know get a perfect score for some people unlike all the other sections of the PAT so as soon as you see that angle ranking is just completely leveling off if that happens to you then just focus on the other parts of the PAT because all of those you can improve all right, thank you. So I know it's almost one, so we're probably gonna ask one more question and then wrap up. But before that, Sarah's gonna drop a link in the chat for our email list. And with this, you guys can like sign up for a newsletter, which we send out, which we send out every Sunday at 9 a.m. And yeah, Rachel, if you wanna go ahead and ask the last question. Thank you guys. All right, yeah. So to close up our panel, we have one final question. Um, it is, uh, how do you balance passive review and active studying, especially for like the biology section um, where biology is sort of like pure memorization for learning? Uh, so I have a feeling that we're gonna talk about the, the same thing. So um, I'll just speak for myself, but I, I use Anki and how to balance active and passive. I just say, pretty much forget about the passive and just work on the active because that's the most efficient way you know study shows like uh that there's a a pyramid right and then at the top you have just like listening reading and you're retaining around like five ten percent of the information at the base of that triangle of that pyramid is um teaching someone so if you teach someone then you know that you have a really good grasp of the, of the subject and you're gonna be able to answer any question about that correctly. And then right above that is active recall. So if you use a flashcard app um, like Anki, I would definitely suggest that. The only time I would do passive studying is if you're like extremely tired, it's the end of the day, but actually no, because if that's the case, just go to bed. I, yeah, I agree. So I actually didn't know about Anki until I got to dental school and everybody around me was using it. It was like the greatest thing ever. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to give it a try. And now I don't study without it. And I've made videos on my YouTube channel about how to use Anki and some of the things that I do. 
yeah, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of, I think once again, everybody's different. You might learn this way, but I don't know if there's a lot of merit to just sitting there and reading through the biology notes. I think boot camps, biology notes is like 600 pages long. And maybe you have a photographic memory and you could sit there and read. But for me, what I would do is, and I think actually boot camp actually has a an Anki deck now, but if so, I would I would take that information and make it into questions in the form of flashcards. And then instead of seeing uh, a question that's asking you about the ACL and, and, and which movement would tear the ACL, you're asked that question and you have to go into your brain and, and pull that out. So I think that there's almost no room for passive studying unless it's really something that's effective for you. I think everything you should be doing is, is active. And that's the way that, that these studying for these tests is, is structured now. Uh, practice tests are active studying and so it's kind of like practice how you play so when you the, the best form of practice from when i played sports years ago was when we actually would scrimmage and simulate a game um so so go in there and and simulate your studying and try not to just sit there for hours and read notes because you might actually just spin your wheels and waste time and not get a whole lot done unless it's like i said something that you're really uh something that's really effective for you Well, that is all the questions we had today. Um, it is like four minutes before one, but we just wanted to say thank you to everyone that showed up to today's event. Um, it was really lovely hearing your thoughts and like insightful um, opinions on like how to study for the DAT. So if you guys have any more questions, feel free to like stay after. Um, but yeah, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much panelists for coming. Um, yeah.